Okay, so good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar titled Put in All Your Eggs in One Basket. Our presenter is Megan Perdue with the University of Maryland Extension. I'm Taylor Robinson, and I will be helping to help I will be helping to facilitate this session. We will be using the chat pod located at the bottom right hand corner throughout this presentation for questions. Please use the arrow key to select everyone or all participants and type your question in. We will be answering questions at the end of this presentation. Before we begin, I would like to say thank you to our sponsors and collaborators listed here on the slide. The blue link listed, which is extension.umd.edu slash women in ag, is where you can find the complete list of upcoming and previously recorded webinars, as well as additional resources. As a reminder, we will be recording this presentation and you, are, you will receive an email with the recording and the PowerPoint slides. At this time, I would like to turn the presentation over to Megan Perdue, and we are happy to have her here today. So Megan, it's all yours. All right, thank you, Taylor. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so we can get started. I make a couple of adjustments. Okay, um, as Taylor said, my name is Megan Purdue. I'm the Agent Associate for Agriculture in Worcester County, Maryland. Um, if you're not familiar with the area, we have a lot of poultry in this area, but it has nothing to do with layers. It's all about meat chickens. All right. Before we get started talking about the chickens, I wanted to talk about the egg, because that's what we're in this business for. When we have backyard layers, we want ultimately we want an egg. And I find it helpful to understand the anatomy of the egg so you can understand why things may go wrong and why we handle eggs the way that we do. Um, the first thing that everybody notices about the egg is the shell. Some of us select for color of the shell when we select chickens, um, but the shell is there. It's to protect the egg. It's protect the em potential embryo. It's protect the yolk, which is the nutrition for the embryo. The shell is very porous, and that's important to keep in mind when we talk about cleaning eggs because we can, if we do things incorrectly, we can actually contaminate and draw bacteria into the egg um, and ruin our egg. So keep in mind that they are very porous. There's thousands of pores in those shells. Um, when an egg is laid, it also, the hen deposits a cuticle around that shell to seal up the pores. But if you wash it, you wash off that cuticle. Inside the egg is the albumin, or the egg white, as most of us know it for. It's also antibacterial. Again, that helps protect the potential embryo, the yolk, that provides nutrition for the embryo. And then we all know what the yolk is. We've all seen the yolk. Um, but keep in mind, that is the nutrition for a developing embryo. It contains a lot of nutrients, which also means that if bacteria enter it, it's a great um, platform for that bacteria to grow and multiply. So when we have an egg, the average egg is about two ounces. 11% of that weight is the shell. Over half of it is the egg white, and just under a third is going to be the yolk. Um, inside the egg, it's mostly made of water. The whole egg itself is 74% water, 13% protein, 11% fat. The egg white is mostly water, 88%, with 11% protein. The egg yolk is just under half water, 17% protein, and 33% fat. Again, keep in mind with the egg yolk that that is nutrition for a developing embryo, so there's a lot of nutrition just in that yolk itself. Um, if you are going to be selling eggs, I found this uh, label to be very interesting, and you can download it at eggnutritioncenter.org, but it gives you all the vitamins, the average amount of vitamins and nutrients that are in an egg. So you can see there's vitamin D, vitamin A, vitamin B6, biotin, along with the fats, the protein. All right, so where do the eggs come from? In chickens, there's only one functioning ovary. The other one is undeveloped. Um, and when in that functioning ovary are all the yolks that she's ever going to have. And they're going to vary in size depending on how old she is, whether she's ready to start laying eggs yet. Um, she could be a young pullet, and they're all going to be undeveloped. Um, if she's laying eggs, there's going to be various stages of yolks in that ovary. Um, there's going to be some that are ready to be 
passed on and made into an egg, and there's going to be some that are like that's that high, the size of a head of a pin. Um, once each yolk matures, it will be released from the oviduct during ovulation. All right, once it's released, it en enters kind of an assembly line um, process, which is the oviduct, to add each component to the egg. And that's important to understand when you have a mishap happen with your egg, like a blood spot on your egg or a meat spot. Something has happened, something's malfunctioned, whether a blood vessel burst, it depends on where it burst in that oviduct, where you're going to find the blood spot on the egg. Um, same thing with the meat spot. If tissue sloughs off during this process, you're going to have a meat spot in your egg. So it enters into this like assembly line. The first thing it's going to enter into is the infundibulum, which is where fertilization occurs if you've had a rooster in there with your hen. It only stays there for about 15 minutes, and then it passes to the magnum where the albumin is formed and added to it. This process, if you've ever cracked open an egg and really looked at it, there's different shades of egg white in there. Um, so there's that's a long process where it keeps adding layer by layer. So this is going to take about three hours. Um, from there, it enters the isthmus where the additional membranes, water, and minerals are added. That's roughly an hour, a little over an hour. Um, and then once it enters the uterus, more water, shell, and the pigments of the colored egg are added. So as you can imagine, this is the longest process. It's going to take 21 hours to get all of that put together. All right, once it's fully formed, the uterus will invert itself and release the egg to the vagina and through the cloaca, and then it's ultimately released, released through the vent, and the cuticle is added during this process. I mean, if you're wondering, it's the round end that comes out. The egg actually switches direction um, before it's laid and comes out round end first. The picture in here is actually I caught a hen actually laying an egg several years ago. Um, and I saw it as it was coming out, and I snapped, was able to snap a photo of it. I've also caught them in my hand, and they're very moist when they're freshly laid. All right, so when you're selecting a laying hen, it, you need to look at what you ultimately want. What are your goals? Um, the best laying hen breeds are the lightweight, scrawny, usually very flighty chickens, like the leghorn. Um, they're very good egg layers, but they don't make good pets, um, and they don't weigh a whole lot, which is great because when you talk about feed conversion, you're not feeding that chicken as much as you might be feeding the meat breed, but you're getting more eggs out of it. Uh, the photo was one that I staged um, because we, my pastor really likes double yolk eggs, so I, we were getting a lot of them. We had some very large meat birds that kept producing double yolk, and we also have bantams, so you can see the little teeny bantam eggs, which are the blue and the green ones, and these monster brown double yolk eggs, and I just did it for a joke for posterity. Um, to make a point, and I put them all, spaced them all, so they all looked very mismatched. Um, but when you get your chickens, your pullets, um, if you, and if you're wanting laying hens, then you want to select pullets. You don't want straight run, because straight run are going to be a mix of males and females. Um, so you select your pullets. Most of them will start laying somewhere between 18 and 22 weeks. Um, once the production starts, it's, the eggs are going to be small, and it's going to be sporadic. So you might only get one egg every few days. As they mature, it'll be more consistent. Um, the egg laying breeds, the good egg layers can lay as many as 280 eggs a year, which is pretty spectacular when you think about it. The hen, she'll lay the largest quantity of eggs during her first year of production. So when she, once she starts that first year, she's going to lay the largest quantity, the most eggs that she will ever lay in a year. Um, the meat breeds, they're going to lay significantly less per year. Some of them are going to be 100 somewhere in 100 to 200 eggs versus our really good egg layers that can lay almost 300 eggs per year. And then your hens are going to typically molt after they've been laying for a year. Um, once they molt, you're going to get larger eggs from them, but you're not going to get as many per year. All right, in order to get the eggs, sorry, I have a notification, um, you need to be feeding your chickens well. So they need to have good nutrition. Um, overweight and underweight hens are going to lay smaller eggs and lay less than hens that are in good body condition. So we saw that what nutrition is in an egg, in order for that hen to put that nutrition in the egg, she has to have that nutrition. So they should be fed a good layer ration once they reach laying age. 
So your commercial laying hens, um, those rations are usually balanced with the appropriate amount of nutrients, the right amount of protein, the right amount of calcium and phosphorus. For a laying hen, she needs roughly 16% protein. And this, that can depend on how much she's eating. Um, if they're not eating as much because of the weather's too hot, then you might need something that's a little bit more nutrient dense. Uh, but your calcium and phosphorus always needs to be in balance. Um, calcium is very important for that eggshell, which is made out of calcium. And then the hen should be fed free choice. They eat to meet their nutritional needs. Um, if you have an overweight or an underweight hen, usually if it's underweight, you know you're not feeding it or there's some health problem going on. If she's overweight, maybe she is picking out a little bit or maybe she needs more exercise. But generally, they're going to eat to meet their nutritional needs, especially while they're laying. And then you can offer oyster shells, free choice. Um, that's a good source of calcium to make sure they are taking enough calcium in. I know there's a lot of people that like to give their hens access to pasture, and that's not a bad idea. Um, when they're on pasture, they can forage for insects and grasses, but keep in mind that they get very little nutrition from pasture. They're not ruminant animals. It's not easy for them to digest grasses like it is for a cow or sheep or a goat. Um, they're going to eat insects, and they're going to get most of the nutrition from that pasture off of the insects, but keep in mind those insects are limited in number. So if you want them to keep getting the nutrition from the insects, then you're going to have to move them to a different area once they clean out the area that they're in. Um, but what it will do for them, it's going to provide them lots of exercise, which is great. Um, that may prevent them in boredom, which can get them into trouble, especially when they're laying. Um, but keep in mind, too, that once you give them access to pasture, it may leave them more vulnerable to predators. Um, so the more open the area it is, the easier it is for a predator to get them, especially if they're in like electric netting or something where it has an open top. Um, if you have eagles or hawks, that would leave them very vulnerable to that. Um, in the picture, I mean, I find it a little gross, but um, I actually just kitted a goat and the hens immediately ran up to it and started eating on the afterbirth. So they will eat whatever it takes to get their nutrition. Um, most people think that they are more the only vegetable matter, but they'll eat insects, they'll eat small snakes, they'll eat small rodents, they'll eat whatever they can get some nutrition out of. All right, when you have smaller flocks, Probably the best thing to do is to go buy a commercial laying head feed from your feed store. Um, I don't recommend any particular brands. Um, when I deal with a lot of my clients, I tell them whatever provides your animal the nutrients that it needs, keeps them in the appropriate body condition, is the right price that you can afford to feed them that feed and in the right quantity and whatever's convenient for you to get. If it takes you three hours to go get the feed that you want, that's probably not the greatest choice for you because you run out, then you have no way to go get it. Um, so you gotta find something that's available and that's gonna work for you. Um, these are balanced. These are already balanced with the correct amount of nutrients for each stage or labeled by stage of production. I mean, if you're raising layers on a larger scale, you may want to work with a poultry nutritionist or a poultry extension specialist to develop your own feed for your program. So they might take into consideration the activity level of your birds if they're free range or if they're out on pasture. Um, you may have a different feed mix for summer versus winter. Um, and because ultimately you need to get the most, the best nutrition into them so you get the most amount of eggs per year from them. So you can maximize your production and your profit. And when you're buying feed in bulk, even custom mixes, sometimes it's cheaper than buying the commercial feed from a feed store. When we talk about nutrition, we absolutely, absolutely must talk about water. We've seen eggs are over 70% water. If a hen is not getting enough water, she's not going to be able to produce those eggs. It is critical for the egg production. When they're not drinking, they're not eating, they're not eating, they're not laying. Um, so always provide plenty of fresh water to your laying hens. Um, your layers are going to drink at least double the amount of water as non-layers. So keep that in mind, you're going to see increased water consumption when you have laying hens versus the non-layers. And dehydration will stop them to stop, will cause them to stop laying. The water must be clean and free from excessive minerals. If you wouldn't drink it, don't expect your animals to drink it. Um, the excess, excessive minerals can cause smell that causes an off taste that they don't like. Um, but they also can act as antagonists to other important minerals that they really need, like calcium. 
Um, so make sure that you're feeding them water that is potable that you could drink if you want to. You may prefer a different, you may prefer bottled water to water out of your hose, um, but if it's not safe for you to drink, then you shouldn't be feeding it to your, or giving it to your animals. And then always keep in mind in the winter months, make sure that they still have water. They need water year round, make sure it's fresh and not frozen. All right, some of the factors that affect your hens and when they're laying. The big one is light. Um, when hens, when the hours of daylight start decreasing in the fall, that causes them to go into a molt, and a lot of them are going to stop laying during that time. Um, if you have pullets that are just reaching laying age in that time, then they may lay through the winter, and that could be a, a method for you to get your round eggs without manipulating the light. But you can trick hens and to keep laying by providing the artificial light. Keep in mind though that you need to be able to turn that out at night. So you can put it on a timer um, if you can't get out there, but they need at least six hours of darkness in order to rest. Um, laying, laying eggs is hard work, so they need their rest too. Um, the breed is gonna affect the laying cycle. Laying hen breeds are gonna have a longer laying cycle and lay more eggs than the dual purpose and the meat breeds. Um, the age, as I mentioned before, that affects it because the quantity of eggs laid per year decreases as the hen ages. Your nutrition, we just spoke about, is going to also affect it. If they're not getting enough energy, it might cause decreased egg production. Um, this could be especially important during the cold weather when their need for energy is going to increase. Um, stress is a big one. If there's an environmental stress, predators, um, change in weather, you've moved them from one coop to the other, that can cause them to stop laying for a period of time, and then disease. Um, hopefully nobody has very many problems with disease in these small flocks, but um, that can be a signal that something's going on if they stop laying. All right, so next I want to talk about health problems for layers, and a lot of this information I got from our poultry veterinarian on campus. Um, he's done a lot of good presentations on um, diseases and health for chickens. Um, the first one, which might be a more common one for a lot of people, is going to be internal parasites. Um, most people who have raised any kind of livestock are familiar with internal parasites. Um, if you have multiple species, hopefully you have less of a problem with it. And usually, if the more confined they are, the more of a problem you have with the internal parasites. The ones we deal with with chickens are roundworms, hairworms, seagorms, and tapeworms. Um, the things that you want to look for to know if you have a problem or a potential problem with them is they just don't look very good. So if you have a hen that's not really laying um, and she still looks rough, you've probably got something going on um, unless she's in a molt. And stunted growth, they're not growing very well, they're too skinny, they're anemic, um, or the egg production has dropped. For treatment, there is a dewormer for chickens, um, but to prevent it, you want to rotate the birds in their yards or their pens. So they're not picking the, they might deposit the worms, but they're not picking them back up. Um, you can do worm your flocks regularly, especially if you have a problem with it, um, especially if you have a ground or a floor pen. And they also offer medicated feed that contains a broad spectrum dewormer. Um, if you do have par internal parasites, you can treat your infected birds with a dewormer. Um, there's one that is approved for poultry by the FDA. It's only effective against two worms. And when you are using any type of medication, no matter what the species is, you have to follow the manufacturer's directions for the species and um, the dosage, and then follow the withdrawal times, especially if you're raising an animal for meat or eggs, like we do in poultry, or milk, if we do in other livestock. Um, if you are not using it on the species that it is labeled for or at the dosage, as I know we all get online and we read about everybody's secret dosage that they use. If you're not following those directions, then you need to be under the direction of a veterinarian that works with you um, so that you are mainly because of those withdrawal periods, but your veterinarian needs to be involved in those decision making. So the veterinarian can prescribe it's something that's not labeled for that species, but you can't do it on your own unless you are working with a veterinarian. Um, in addition to internal parasites, birds can get external parasites. Um, the ones that are most common with chickens are the scaly leg mite, chicken mite, northern fowl mite. Um, some of the signs that you might be dealing with a scaly leg mite are scales and crusts in legs, combs and wattles, so anything that's not covered in feathers. 
Um, the northern fowl mite, you're going to see blackened feathers, scabby skin around the vent. For the scaly leg mite, you need to call or isolate those affected birds, and you can apply an oil-based product um, like petroleum jelly or 50-50 kerosene and cooking oil mix. Um, and then there's a blue ribbon commercial mixture um, that will treat that. You want to apply that to the affected areas. The northern fowl mite, for that you need to monitor all the birds in the facilities for infestation. So if you have them on one, then you need to watch everybody else for it and everything that you use with the chickens. Just make sure it doesn't have it. So check your egg flats and any casings for mites. Uh, treat the birds with insecticides such as sun dust. Use dry powder to dust the birds, and then you can use a liquid spray or wettable powder to um, treat the facilities and make sure you get the cracks in the crevices. Wash any flats, egg flats, anything that you use with the poultry, make sure you wash them with hot water and detergent. And again, follow all the manufacturer's directions. If you have any questions about something, if it's not labeled for it, then check with your veterinarian or check with um, someone in your extension office to make sure that you are using it correctly. Something a little bit more common that you might see is bumblefoot. You see the swollen feet and they're lame on it. Um, this is usually caused by an injury to the foot um, and then it gets infected with staph. So some of the com common causes of the injury are going to be like if they're on a rough perch and they get a splinter, they're on a wire floor and they get cut. Um, you have poor bedding that maybe sticks in them. The bedding quality isn't the greatest that can cause them to get an injury and it get infected. The sign you're going to see is the bird's not going to be walking very well and the foot's going to swell. And under that swelling, if it doesn't burst on its own, it's hard to build abscess. Um, to prevent that, and that's always best to prevent these things, is make sure that anything that they are, their feet come into contact with is good quality and not rough, um, especially their bedding. Keep everything clean, dry, and deep so they don't go through it because you know chickens love to scratch. Um, keep your perches, low, perches lower to the ground um, so that your big birds don't get injured when they jump. Um, and then remove anything that could potentially injure their feet. Um, if you do end up with a bird with it, you can soak the foot in warm water and Epsom salt. You want to clean it and disinfect it. And then if it's open, go ahead and drain the pus. Um, if there's no break in the skin, then you can break the skin yourself. You want to use something that's sterile, like a scalpel um, or a sterile blade. A large gauge needle might work. Um, just make sure it's a new needle. And then once you drain the abscess, you need to flush it with hydrogen peroxide to clean it out. Um, and then you can pack it with an antibiotic ointment and wrap the foot with gauze and elastic bandage. And if you do that, you need to repeat it every day. If you are using elastic bandage, such as vet wrap, um, from personal experience with working with animals with it, um, you need to have a lot of padding there because those elastic bandages will constrict as time goes on. So if you leave them on there for more than an hour or so, they may constrict and block off the blood flow and then you may have swelling for a totally different reason. So make sure if you are using them to use plenty of padding in between so that it cannot constrict around the foot or change it very, very frequently. Um, another more common one if for people who've raised a lot of laying hens is prolapse. Um, this usually happens to overweight hens um, or pullets that weren't quite old enough, shouldn't be quite be laying yet, um, that are in egg production. They're not mature as they should be. Um, the rations are unbalanced or you have a hen that's laying a lot of double yolk eggs. Um, I know when we've had chickens over the years when I was younger, my mom we used to give a lot of double yolk eggs and my mom would say well, that's not good for that hen and this is why. Um, some signs before, you know, if you don't see the prolapse, some signs might be a blood streaked egg um, or you can see the uterus stays inverted and outside of the vent like the picture. Or you see other chickens pecking at it. Um, to prevent this, you don't want to photo stimulate your pullets who aren't quite mature yet. They need to be at the appropriate weight. Make sure your diet is balanced for them and avoid um, light intensity that is too high. And then decrease the feed consumption if your flock is producing too many double yolk eggs. For treatment, it's very unlikely that it's going to be successful, but it doesn't hurt to try. Most people like to try something. Um, so if the other hens are if she's in there with other hens, then you need to use a low intensity red bulb so they can't see the prolapse. Um, you can try to gently massage the prolapse back inside if it's new, a new prolapse. 
Um, and then you need to isolate your affected hens because they're obviously not going to be feeling well and they don't need the stress from other chickens pecking at them. Egg binding. Um, this is when an egg gets stuck in the overduct, so she can't pass it, and it is deadly. So this can happen to overweight hens, um, hens that are producing large eggs, hens that have a calcium deficiency or a disease. These can all contribute to an egg getting stuck. Um, some of the signs might be the hen is lethargic. Um, she might see her straining, might be a swollen abdomen, a swollen vent, or you may just find it dead bird. Um, so for treatment, really, in order to be effective, you need to contact a veterinarian. Um, but if that is not an option for you, you can palpate to feel the egg and try to get it out. Um, if everything's too tight, you can try to warm the muscles to relax the vent. Um, if all else fails, you need to carefully puncture the egg and remove the contents. So remove the contents of the inside of the egg, try to remove the large pieces of shell. Um, just be careful that you don't injure the hen while you're doing this. But if you do leave her untreated, she'll go into shock and she will die. So this is something where you have to act, you have to do something, or you can call her. Um, but something needs to be done because she will die if you leave her. All right, and occasionally we all get bad eggs. Um, an occasional odd shape, bloody or wrinkled egg is or missing shell. I've gotten a couple of those. Those are those are the ones I like the most because um, they're intact with the membrane. Um, that happening occasionally is not necessarily a problem. If you get a lot of those weird misshapen eggs or bad eggs, there could be a health problem such as disease. The birds may be stressed. Nutrition might not be right, or they might just be getting older. Um, I found this one right after I put together this presentation the first time. Um, I found this uh, common, 20 common eggshell quality problems from Alltech. I've put the address in there where you can download it as a PDF file. Um, but this is interesting to keep on hand in case you do get an odd egg. You can look and see what the causes are um, and see if it's something you should be worried about or not. All right, not everything is a health problem. Some of these problems we have with chickens are behavioral problems. Um, so the first one I want to talk about is egg breaking. It's probably going to, be, going to be fairly common, especially if you have a large amount of birds. You're going to find one bad hen that likes to break and eat the eggs. This is considered a form of cannibalism. Um, some of the signs might, you just might see a broken egg in the nest of eggs, or you might see the hen with yolk on her face. Then you know who the culprit is. Um, for this, you want to remove the perpetrators as soon as possible because they'll teach this behavior to others. They're going to be breaking your eggs. They might not break just one egg. They might break several eggs. Um, you can call her. Um, you can isolate her and put her in a cage with a fake egg in her nest. So hopefully she pecks at that and realizes she can't break that and gets out of the habit. But the sooner you get her out, the better, most, your better chances of getting her to break that behavior are. If you let it go on for a long time, you're not going to be able to break the behavior. And sometimes you might, you aren't able to break the behavior anyways, but you don't want her to teach that to others. You don't want her to ruin your eggs. Um, to prevent this, you don't feed eggs to chickens. They love the taste of them. You don't want them to recognize that it's an egg and decide to start breaking them themselves. So if you are feeding any shells to chickens, then you want to make sure that you crush them so they don't recognize them. You can put fake eggs in the nest. That way, if they test the waters and try to break that, they realize you can't break it, they won't try others. Um, if you're having big problems with it, choose less aggressive breeds. Some breeds are more likely to do it than others. And if you know you have a bad hen that does this, do not hatch any chicks from her. Another problem that you may run into is broodiness. Um, again, this might be a breed problem. Some breeds are more prone to do it than others. Um, the signs, it's hard, sometimes hard to distinguish between a hen that's broody and a hen that's just laying her egg. Um, but you have a hen that's been there on a nest for a long time and she's being very protective of the nest, she's probably getting broody. Discourage it as soon as possible because once she gets broody, the longer it takes her to get out of that broodiness, the longer it's going to take her to start laying eggs again. So you want to, re the first thing you do is remove the eggs from the nest. Um, you can remove the hen from the nest. If she still returns to it, you can destroy the nest, you can block her from getting to the nest, or you can put her in a different pen if necessary. Um, if all else fails, you can, if you have um, some hens that you want to hatch some eggs from, you can let her do the hatching. Um, some of these hens will stay on an empty nest and they won't leave until they get a live chick with them. Um, so you can use her to incubate your eggs. They will starve to death. Some of them will stay on the nest and starve to death. And 
things you don't do, either break up the brooding behavior or give them an egg to set. Um, or if you don't, if you're not interested in hatching any replacement chicks, then you can call her because while she's brooding, she's not laying any eggs for you. And she's probably going to do it again next season. All right, a totally normal process that doesn't look very nice but occurs every year um, is molting. It happens once a year after the hen has been laying for a year. They lose their feathers and they replace them with new feathers. And this happens in a step-by-step -step process. It usually starts happening in the fall when the days are shortening. Um, your good layers are going to wait until late to molt, and they usually will molt very fast um, versus the poor layers that molt slow. Um, they're going to stop laying during the molt because they're redirecting all of their nutrients to making new feathers. Um, but this can be caused by other things such as disease and stress. Usually the molts are not a problem, but keep in mind I had one that molted extremely fast, was almost bald, and a cold snap hit. We had to move her to a pen to keep her protected from the cold air. Um, the next year she did the same thing. We couldn't catch her and we lost her during a cold night um, to exposure. So keep an eye on your hens. If you notice your good layers are molting very fast and losing a lot of feathers all at once, if it's getting cold, you need to take precautions and move to a warmer coop. All right, so we've talked a little bit about lazy layers. Um, so we're going to talk about how to distinguish your good layers from your lazy layers. So your lazy hens, keep in mind, you know, you might like them and they might be pretty, but they're not laying, this, but they're still eating the same amount. They're taking up valuable space. So you want to call them if necessary. Don't try to call your non-layers during a molt, though, because they might all look alike because your good layers are not laying during that time either. Um, but your good layers are going to look rough. They're going to have rough feathers, bleached out skin, large combs. And we have a couple pictures coming up of it. So for this first picture, the good layer is the one with the bright, big comb and wattles. Um, the poor layer has the shorter comb. Um, if you look at the vent, the good layer has a bleached out vent, which that's where they usually lose that yellow pigmentation first. Um, it's bigger, it's oval shaped versus the poor layer has very tight uh, vent and hasn't lost any of the pigmentation in it. If you look at the feet, the good layer is bleached, her feet are bleached out. They're very pale yellow versus the poor layer still has that nice bright yellow color to her feet. Um, again, you can see on the underside that the good layer is very bleached out versus the poor layer that has the nice yellow pigmentation. Um, if you look at the pubic bones on them, you want to see how big they are. The bigger the space is, the more likely she is to be a good layer. So if you can fit three or more fingers between the pubic bones, then she's laying. Um, if you can't fit three or more, then she's not laying. Um, again, you can do the same thing. This shows it from a different angle. If you can fit four or more fingers between the keel and the pubic bone, then she's probably a good layer. If you cannot fit four more fingers, then she's not laying. And you want it, the more fingers you can fit between those bones, the better. She should be soft, but not firm. All right, so we've talked about the hens. Let's talk about the eggs and what you should do when you're handling eggs and how to get good eggs. So the first thing you need to provide for your hens, you need to have some nest boxes available for them. Um, this is going to encourage them to lay in an area where you can find them, hopefully, and not hide them. Um, you want to make sure they're pretty spacious. So for most hens, most standard size laying hens, you need at least 12 inches by 12 inches by 12 inches. If you have larger breed birds, you want to make them larger. Um, plan for one nest box for every four to six hens. Most of the time they find one box that everybody wants to lay in because that's a good box and they'll stand in line or run each other off of it. Um, but hopefully you have more options and they will find the other nest boxes. And make sure they're sturdy. If they jump up there and it's not sturdy, they're not going to feel safe. So they're not going to want to lay there. You want it in a shaded area. This is a private thing for them. They want to feel safe and they want to have privacy. They don't want potential predators coming by. They don't want other animals lurking by. They don't really want you coming by and peeking in on them. So make sure that it got some, it's kind of dark and shaded. I personally like a little bit of light through there because I want to know what I'm sticking my hand into. Um, the picture off to the side is actually a rabbit hutch that our hens decided that they prefer to the fancy uh, nest boxes that my brother built. And they all like to lay in that one rabbit hutch, which is very spacious and very nice. 
that you can make them out of anything. The center picture on the bottom is just a feed bar or old barrels that they cut the lids off of to make a nest box. Place an indestructible fake egg in there to encourage the other hens to lay because if one hen has laid an egg in there, then they think it's safe and they'll go back and lay their eggs there too. Um, but they also can't break it, so it discourages bad behavior. Don't place them under a roost. While they're roosting, they're also pooping. Um, so your nest boxes will fill with manure, and that's what that one picture shows. If you look at the rail, um, there's all kinds of manure up and down that rail from where they nest, and they're actually roosting up in the rafters of a shed. Use good quality bedding. Change it regularly, or if it gets dirty, you want to change it so that your eggs remain clean. Um, the hens are going to prefer soft spots to lay eggs in, so they might prefer your hay shed to a nesting box if you have hay. Um, but this good bedding will help keep them clean. It will prevent them from breaking the eggs. So the egg has a soft spot to lay in. Um, I'll put them in an area where they may be predators. Um, that cat picture is that the head has actually made himself a bed in the nest box. Um, so the hens no longer use that nest box. When you collect your eggs, you want to collect the eggs at least once a day, preferably two or more times a day. Um, when you collect them more often, it's going to prevent them from getting dirty and less likely to be damaged by other hens, because each hen that gets in there could potentially leave a mess, or she could break the eggs, whether it's on purpose or by accident. Um, also, avoid cracking them while you're collecting them. You want to use a good egg basket. I know the egg aprons are very popular right now and that would keep them clean. However, if it was me, I'd probably lean up against something and break them or a goat would jump up on me and break the eggs. So I do not use an egg apron. Um, I do use feed scoops occasionally, but if I was selling those eggs, I would not use a feed scoop because it has feed residue in it. Um, while you're collecting them, promptly clean any eggs that are mildly dirty. So there's a little bit of dirt on it or manure on it. Clean it off with a cloth or a sanding pad as soon as possible. Um, while you're collecting eggs, search for hidden eggs. The one picture shows the hen hidden a nest behind the hay. Nobody saw it until we used a bunch of the hay up and there was a huge nest of eggs in there. Um, those will draw. Not only do you lose those eggs, they go bad, but they also draw stuff that you don't want, like snakes, to the area. Um, and if you don't know, snakes can kill your chicks, too. I think it was yesterday. We had a six-week-old pullet that was killed by a snake, and she was too big for him to eat, so he spit her back out. Um, you could tell because her neck and her head were soaking wet, and she was in the middle of her cage. Her cage was completely enclosed. So you don't want to draw anything to your, your coop or your nesting area, so make sure you keep all those eggs picked up and look for the hidden ones. Um, sometimes the hen will get caught short. Um, the picture with the sheep in it is that you look at the arrow. That's actually an egg. I guess the hen was out cleaning up what the sheep had left behind, found a little bit of grain in the feed bunk and got caught short and laid her egg in the feed bunk. Um, since there was no bedding on there, the entire egg was cracked, had tiny cracks all over it. Um, but it was interesting. I've also found them in the garden before. So you want to, that egg got tossed to my dogs that eat them my big dogs that don't have go anywhere near the chicken nest. Uh, but you want to discard your contaminated or damaged eggs. Um, don't feed them to anything that you don't want to develop a taste for eggs, like your other chickens or animals that have access to the nest. Dogs, once they develop a taste for eggs, they're going to become egg thieves and they're going to go and steal your eggs. I had a corgi who was in the area, at least in the area, where we keep the hens and he would go and look, you'd see him going out and looking for eggs. He knew where all the hens laid eggs. He'd get an egg or two a day and he'd go break it and eat it. Um, but once they develop that taste for eggs with any chicken or any other animal, they're going to continue to look for them. So be careful what animals you feed them to. Once you've collected your eggs, um, you need to properly clean them and store them, especially if they're going to be used for human consumption. So clean your slightly dirty eggs, um, rub, rub them with fine sandpaper. Um, if you need to wash them, only wash them if you need to, but if you need to wash them, you need to wash them in water that you could drink, so bubble water. And the water, be very careful, the water must be at least 90 degrees Fahrenheit and 20 degrees warmer than the egg. That is to prevent bacteria from being sucked through the pores of the shell. Only use detergents that are approved for washing eggs. You shouldn't submerge them in water. Um, once you're done washing them, our Department of Agriculture recommends that you rinse them with a sanitizer 
Um, the sanitizer they recommend is half an ounce of household bleach mixed with one gallon of water. Once you're done rinsing them with sanitizer, dry them off immediately. Do not wash any eggs that you have used the sandpaper on though. And then keep in mind, once you've washed the eggs, it removes, it removes the protective cuticle that keeps the bacteria from entering the egg. Um, our MDA put out a nice um, document and the link is listed at the bottom that has all the guidelines for small producers cleaning eggs. All right, once you've cleaned them, you need to store them properly, place them in clean cartons, um, avoid cross-contamination. So if you have put dirty eggs in that carton, do not put clean eggs in that carton. Um, you should probably dispose of it. Um, so you want them in clean cartons that they're not going to get contaminated with. Store them pointed egg in down and store them at or below 45 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, our Department of Agriculture, they recommend that the shelf life is 30 to 40 days under refrigeration, or if you are freezing eggs, they can be stored up to one year. All right, a lot of people find out that they don't eat nearly as many eggs as they thought they did when they first started purchasing chickens. And sometimes you purchase chickens based on looks without thinking about how many eggs you actually need. Um, and it can get out of hand pretty quickly. Um, so if you find yourself with an excess amount of eggs and you want to sell them, you need to check with your State Department of Agriculture to see what the regulations are regarding selling or even giving away eggs for human consumption, animal consumption, or incubation. Um, these regulations may include that your flock may have to be registered with the state. Um, some states require salmonella testing. Um, the eggs may need to be graded and sized, and you have to adhere to storage guidelines many times. For packaging, they may require specific things on the packaging, like labeling it with the flock registration number, lot number, grade, size, your seller information, a safe handling statement, um, as well as many other things they could put on there. So make sure you check with your Department of Agriculture to see what those restrictions are. All right, this is a friendly reminder from the CDC about keeping your family and your flock healthy. Um, wash your hands after you've been handling poultry products or working with your chickens, um, cleaning anything out. Most health departments recommend that children under the age of five and adults older than 65 don't handle poultry, and especially those with weakened immune systems. Um, and you don't want to kiss and snuggle your chickens and keep them outside versus coming inside. All right, and if there are any questions, I can take those or you feel, can feel free to email me if you have any questions and I will get you an answer. So Megan, there is a question in the chat pod. How can you ensure nutrient intake for hens that are on pasture? Is there a, a way to test for that? Um, let me see. Is there any way for me to see the question? Yes. Okay. okay. Here, I see it. Bring up your chat pod. Okay. How can you ensure nutrient intake for hens that are on pasture? Um, for chickens, I wouldn't count on a lot of of them getting a lot of nutrition from their pasture. Um, there's no way for you to know how many insects they are eating and what nutrition is out of the insects. And they're not an animal that's designed to eat a lot of grasses. Um, you can put more nutritious grasses out there for them, but I wouldn't count on that for their nutrition. I would balance their um, nutrients based on the feed that you are feeding them and then everything they get on the pasture is a bonus and since they eat to meet their nutritional needs um you'll see you know they may be eating consuming less of the feed that you are offering them um and you can tell put for the egg production and how they look if they have good egg production um then they're getting what they need um they're still going to look rough that's the that's the kind of the hateful thing about chickens, the better they're producing, the rougher they look. Um, but if you are getting, if your chickens seem healthy, happy and healthy, um, then they're probably getting, and they're producing eggs, they're probably getting what they need. Um, but again, I wouldn't count on them getting anything. I don't think it would be worth it to try to determine that. Um, you're, they're basically getting 
treats out on pasture and they're getting the exercise. I hope that I hope that answers the question. And you can always go to a poultry specialist to see if there is any somebody somewhere may have done a little bit of data, but I think um, since they're not a ruminant animal that digests grasses, they're not going to get a lot out of it. They're going to get a little bit, but not a lot out of it. Right, and there's another question. How often do you recommend giving broad dewormer? Some people never give it and are fine. It would depend on if you have a problem with parasites. Um, if they're confined, then you may have to, and you've had a problem with it, you may have to give it monthly. Um, but if you're not, I deal with a lot of small ruminants and we don't, do, we only do worm as needed because they get resistant to it. And internal parasites are a huge problem for small ruminants because they get a lot of nutrition from pasture. Um, so they're constantly eating on the ground where the parasite larva is. Um, so if you have a problem with it, then you need, I would talk to an extension specialist to see, you know, whether it's something, you, or your veterinarian to see if it's something you should start doing regularly every month. Um, or if it's a one-time thing. Now, me personally, on the sustainability side of it, if I had a problem with parasites, I would probably deworm them and then move them somewhere else and start rotating them so that I didn't have to constantly deworm because um, I don't think it's I don't think it's healthy to continue to deworm because you're going to end up with resistance eventually, and or you could feed a medicated seed that has it in it um, if it's that much of a problem. But I would take steps to try to not need that dewormer. Very good. And did you, there's another one, do you recommend removing new chicks from the flock for protection? Um, that would depend on where you are. Um, like I said the other day, we had a couple of hens that hatched, we, they got very broody, finally gave in, let them hatch a chick and keep the chick because they were not they were not, would not leave the nest without a live chick. So we put them in pens that were safe from the cats, because usually cats are the ones that are going to get your chicks. Um, or if you're in an area with a lot of rats, a rat would. But in our, in our house, it's the cats. Um, and if they're running around the barnyard, the cats are going to get them. Um, put them in a pen we thought was very safe, and I had two-week-old chick that just disappeared. And we're like, okay, maybe something got in there and got it. Um, and then yesterday, a snake got an older chick, and those were confined away from the rest of the flocks. In this situation, they'd have been safer with the flocks. So and now we have another hen with two chicks. We're just going to let her run loose. Um, so it depends on your situation. If, they, if you have raccoons or fox or you have any kind of predators around where if they're not quick and they don't, they're young chicks, they're dependent on mom to keep them safe, um, then you might need to separate them. But again, once you separate them, make sure that pen that they're in is safe from other stuff that you might not be aware of. Um, but again, it depends on your situation. Um, most For most people that kind of let theirs free range a little bit more, chicks are safer, more confined than the rest of the flock. Um, typically, we leave ours up until they would be ready to be released without artificial heat. So they're fully feathered out, got a little bit of size to them or a little quicker. Um, but again, it depends on your situation. Um, if you have any more questions about it, you can email me with your specifics and your setup, um, and I can give you a little bit more details. Very good. Megan, I learned a lot today. I'm a green girl, so uh, I think I'm going to go buy some chickens now and, and raise some eggs. Great <laughs> <Dried> eggs. <laughs> yeah, I need some eggs. <laughs> You'll never like it's you'll never know how few eggs you eat until you're producing eggs. <laughs> I'm gonna go ahead and stop you know, recording. You have ten dozen eggs in your refrigerator. <laughs>